Hello everyone! Every time I make a new video, I look at what I've created and I think, wow, I should really make a video on anti-aliasing. Just look at those jagged edges. So today, we're talking about the exact opposite of anti-aliasing. By now, it's common knowledge that dead cells, despite looking, acting, and behaving like pixel art, isn't actually pixel art because we as artists have to gatekeep our mediums. Dead Cells uses a shader to flatten and upscale a 3D model. Then, it bakes the animations to a sprite sheet to emulate fluid pixel art animations, which allows them to support the wide variety of weapons in the game without having to spend years animating each individual weapon. This technique is really common nowadays, with a recent example being Loot River in which all the enemies and the player are actually 3D models. At least, I think they are, it's hard to tell sometimes. Regardless, how does a shader like this even work? Pixel art has several distinct aspects that separate it from other art mediums. The most obvious feature of pixel art is its low resolution, which accentuates the individual pixels, so our shader needs to be able to replicate this appearance. Accentuating pixels in this context means enlarging them, but unfortunately for us, our render is already the same size as the screen. If we enlarge it, then the pixels have nowhere to go except back down to the same resolution, which wouldn't accomplish much. Instead, we need to downscale our render first, in the same way we did for blurring as described in my Elden Ring video. But Ace Rolla, wouldn't this blur the whole image? Maybe. That depends on the texture sampler we use when we do the scaling. Texture samplers control what happens to pixels when they are upscaled or downscaled. Specifically, they define what happens when there's either not enough space for all the pixels, or there's too much space. The four most common sampler types are point filtering, bilinear filtering, trilinear filtering, and anisotropic filtering. Point filtering is the cheapest, easiest, smallest brain sampler available. When there's not enough space for two pixels, then it uses the color of the closest pixel to that coordinate. And when there's too much space, then it fills in the space with the color of the closest pixel. Bilinear filtering is what we used for our blurring. When there's not enough space for two pixels, then it takes a weighted average of the four nearest pixels. It does this when space needs to be filled in as well. Trilinear filtering and anisotropic filtering are the same as bilinear filtering, except they also interpolate between the two nearest mipmap levels. What are mipmaps, you ask? I don't know, man, Google it or something. Out of these four options, the one we want for pixel art is quite obvious. The point filtering will preserve our pixel art as it gets upscaled back to full resolution. Back to our shader, if we downscale our render a few times, the pixels become very large. As a rule of thumb, you only want to downscale and upscale by powers of 2, which will keep your pixels square. If you don't do this, you will get pixels of variable width and height, which will look really bad. Unfortunately, we have one issue that is outside our shader's control, which is the camera projection. Currently, our camera is set to perspective projection mode, meaning that objects have depth to them. If we want to emulate pixel art, then we want to change the projection mode to orthographic, which will flatten all objects in view and remove any depth perception. As you can see, Sheik looks much more like pixel art when rotated with the orthographic projection. Now, downscaling by itself might be satisfactory for you and your game, but we're still missing a crucial aspect of pixel art, which is a limited color palette. How can we convert our image into a smaller color palette? Dithering is an intentionally applied form of noise, which is used to prevent large-scale patterns like color banding. One of the most common uses of dithering is converting grayscale images to black and white, such that the density of black pixels is roughly equivalent to the average gray level of the original image. This conversion could be thought of as reducing the color palette to 2-bit, where pixels are either white or black. Thankfully, the algorithm expands to support any n-bit color palette from 2 to 256, 
But first, we need to decide on a dither pattern to use. For my demonstrations, I will be using ordered dithering, also known as Bayer dithering. This pattern utilizes something called a threshold map, which is a matrix of equally distributed values from 0 to n squared minus 1, where n is the dimension of the matrix. While it is possible to calculate these threshold maps in real time, it's really inefficient. Instead, we can pre-compute the values and store them in a lookup table to be used by the shader. Finding the new color of a pixel with dithering starts by retrieving the threshold map value. We take the position of our pixel on the screen, which is obtainable by multiplying the UV coordinate by the width or height of the screen. Then, we mod the position by n, where n is the dimension of the threshold map which converts it into the coordinates of the threshold map value. With the threshold map value, we multiply it by 1 over n squared to convert it into the 0 to 1 range, then we subtract 0.5. This final value is the noise that we'll be adding to our image. We multiply it by a user-defined spread value, which will control how much the noise spreads the color. This results in a strange lattice pattern across the whole image. While this looks neat, we still haven't compressed our color. To obtain our new color palette, we first take the number of colors we want and subtract 1. Then, we multiply our new color with this value, add 0.5, and take the floor. Lastly, we divide by the number of colors minus 1. This will convert any color value to its nearest neighbor in the new color palette. For example, let's consider the two color case. If we passed in a color value of 0.2, then we would multiply it by 1, add 0.5, and take the floor. Then, we divide it by 1, which gives us a new color value of 0. If we instead passed in 0.6, we would multiply it by 1, add 0.5, take the floor, and divide it by 1, which would give us a new color value of 1. From this, we can deduce that any color value less than 0.5 will be 0, and any color greater than 0.5 will be 1, meaning that our image is only allowed two values per color channel. Our chic render has now been reduced from 16,770,216 available colors to 8. This obviously doesn't look very good, so here's a montage of larger color palettes. Now that our color palette is reduced to whatever we think looks good, we can utilize the same downscaling technique to enlarge the dithering and accentuate the individual pixels. Our effect is now complete. If you want flat color sections like dead cells, then you can simply set the dither spread to zero, but then you don't really need to do any dithering in the first place. This shader looks pretty good on Chic, but what about in an environment like my grass field? While it looks nice without any downscaling and 8 colors per channel, if we downscale at all or reduce the number of colors, we lose all visual information on the grass, and it turns into this big green blob. Thankfully, there exists a simple image effect that remedies this issue. Sharpness is an effect that increases the contrast between edges in an image. This increased contrast tricks us into thinking images are more detailed than they actually are. Sharpening an image involves taking a pixel's neighbors and multiplying them by a sharpness value and negative 1. Then, we multiply the center pixel by a sharpness value and 4 and add 1. Lastly, we add the neighbors values to the center pixel and this is our new pixel color. 
If we first sharpen the image and then apply our pixel art filter, we can see a lot more detail out of our grass field instead of a giant green blob, even when downscaled. Another neat effect is using sharpness after the dithering, which I think looks pretty cool since it accentuates the pixels. We're not quite finished yet, I still have one more effect to show to you. Back when I was explaining dithering, I mentioned converting a grayscale image to black and white. This is the two color case, since all color channels are the same value, then all pixels become either black or white. But if we increase the color count, we get an equivalent amount of grayscale values. If we visualize these colors in a row, it begins to sort of look like color palettes you see on those fancy color websites. I wonder if we can do anything with that. Looking at our grayscale colors, on the left we have 0, and on the right we have 1. Then we have 0.25 and 0.75 in the middle. Coincidentally, the horizontal UV coordinate of each color block is identical to the grayscale value. If we were to perhaps take this grayscale value and use it as the horizontal UV coordinate for a separate, new color scheme, we could theoretically replace our grayscale values with any color palette. As long as our palette has the same amount of colors as grayscale values, we can create any size color palette from two colors to 256. Here's a demonstration of a few different color palettes. Well, that's about it for me. As usual, the code is in the description if you'd like to play around with it. I'm pretty happy with how these effects turned out, so please let me know what you think. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you next time.